You're listening to the Bethel Community Church Podcast. Our podcast normally showcases our weekly sermons here in Chicago at 7601 West Foster. Now, podcasts are great, but they do not replace the care and community you receive from the local church or from your local pastor. So we encourage you to come join our community or contact us to help you find a community in your area. We pray the Lord speaks to you as you listen. Enjoy. Children uh, who are still in the service are dismissed at this time for Bethel Kids. For everybody else, we're going to be continuing our series through the book of Haggai, and so I would invite you to turn to Haggai. We're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 10 through 19 today. If you're using the Pew Bible, that will be on page 791, 791. Let's go to Lord in prayer Uh, as we begin our time looking at His Word. Father in heaven, we praise You. You are God Almighty. We thank You that this morning we can gather as Your people, and thank You that as we do so, we know that You are at work in our midst, and You are at work throughout this world. Lord, is Tom mentioned TNR serving you. We pray that you would be with them and uh, the other missionaries who are serving you around the world, that you would work out all of the details for visas and moves and that you would give them open doors for the advance of the gospel. Father, we certainly pray for our sister Edith, that you would watch over and keep her as we prayed. And for others who can't be with us this morning for various reasons, That you would remind them that your promise is to be with them always, even to the end of the age. We pray that those who are able would be with us again next week. Lord, help us to reach out to our church family and to not just tell them, Lord, that we miss them, but also to find out ways we can be of help to them. Father, now as we look to your word, Lord, there are all sorts of distractions, all sorts of things going on. But Father, I pray that you would help us to focus on what you say this morning, to hear from you, and we pray that you would be working in us by your Spirit and that you would speak through me. Lord, with the Apostle Paul, I cry out, who is sufficient for these things? Thank you, Lord, that though I am a sinful man, my sufficiency is found in Jesus. And so, Father, speak through me to your people, and we pray that we would hear from you, and that we would Respond to what you say in faith. We believe in the Holy Spirit and entrust this work to you in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's begin by reading Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. Thus says the Lord, On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius... The word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands... And what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. 
I struck you with all the products of your toil, with blight and with mildew and with hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded Nothing, but from this day on, I will bless you. And thus ends the reading of God's word. I don't want to see a show of hands, but have any of you experienced shame, even debilitating shame in your life? Sure, most of us, if not all of us, have. Ed Welch, in his book, Shame Interrupted, defines shame as the deep sense that you are unacceptable because of something you did, something that's been done to you, or something that has been associated with you. And so in shame, you feel exposed, you feel humiliated disgraced, defiled, contaminated, unclean. Now, shame isn't merely a feeling. Shame is real because defilement is, un- is real. And since the COVID pandemic, we have understood that, yes, there are things that are unclean in this world, things that are defiled, and yet we need to be careful so that we do not mistake our modern understanding of something being clean and sanitary with the biblical understanding of something being clean or holy. You see, being clean or unclean, holy or common, is not about germs per se. Rather, being clean or unclean, holy or unholy or or common, is about a condition, a status before God. And so, to be holy is to be set apart to God. So, for instance, the priests in the temple and even the nation of Israel were holy. They were set apart to God. But then within life, there were many things that were common, unholy. Things that you could use in everyday life. But then anything that was, whether it was holy or whether it was common, it could be or become Clean or unclean. So for instance, goats were considered a clean animal or sheep were considered clean animals. They were acceptable to God and his people. Whereas pigs were considered to be unclean, unacceptable to God and his people. It's important that we understand these distinctions in order to understand Haggai chapter 2 this morning. We must understand the distinctions between clean and unclean, holy and common, in order to understand what Haggai is saying to us today. You see, he was speaking to a people who had come back from exile due to their sin, and yet they were still defiled, unclean, even though they were back in the land. And so the question for them is, how could they be made clean so that they would be acceptable to God? That same question faces each and every one of us this morning. How can we who are sinners be clean And acceptable to a holy God. Well, this week and next week, we will see what I would call the gospel according to Haggai. So the main idea from our passage this morning 
is that because we are defiled by sin, only God can change our status. Only God can make us clean to stand before him and be acceptable before him. And God makes us clean by his grace alone so that he can bless us. And so this morning as we unpack Haggai 2, 10 through 19, we'll see Haggai gives, gives us three problems leading to one solution and one proper response. So let us begin with the first problem we see in verses 10 through 14. It is that sin defiles you. Sin defiles everything that you do. And this is Haggai's third message. And he gives it on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, as he says. So this would have been December 18th, 520 BC. It would have been winter. So, this is three months following the beginning of the rebuilding efforts on the temple. And we don't know if this is any sort of a special day. It wasn't on the religious calendar. Perhaps this was, you know, sort of like an official groundbreaking ceremony day. We, We don't know. But yet, Haggai the prophet, on this day, gives a prophetic double feature. He he gives a message first to the priests and the people, and then, as we'll see next week, to Zerubbabel, the governor. And he begins by addressing the priests. God wants him to ask the priests two really softball kind of questions for them. You see, the priests were the experts in the law, and so it was their job to teach the people the distinctions between what was holy and what was common. What was clean and what was unclean or defiled. So, verse 12, Haggai asks them the question, If someone carries holy meat, it's holy because it's been offered in sacrifice, probably at a fellowship offering, and he's carrying it in the fold of his garment. This was the normal way to carry meat back then. If you were taking it anywhere, they didn't have Tupperware. They didn't have plastic bags. So he's taking it home. And according to Leviticus 6, verse 27, anything that touched holy meat, any garment, then had to be washed in a holy place because that garment had become holy. And so Haggai asks the priest, let, let's say that he's carried it home the fold of his garment. The garment touches something else. Does that other food or whatever else the garment touches, does that other thing become holy? Is it an easy one for the priest? No, it doesn't. Holiness isn't contagious like that. You can't transfer it that way. Verse 13, then Haggai says, okay, let's take the opposite. If someone who's unclean by contact with a dead body, for instance, touches anything, does that other thing then become unclean? Again, there's an easy one for the priest to answer. Yes, that other object does become unclean. You see, there was no five-second rule where it's, you know, you get to, it fell on the floor, it's fine. No. Immediately, it became unclean by contact. British commentator Alec Montier does a great job helping us to understand the contagious nature of Something that is dirty or greasy. Think about it this way. If your hands are clean and you go up to a dirty wall and you touch it, does the wall become clean? No, you you don't somehow make the wall clean by your handprint. But if your hand is dirty or greasy and you go up to a wall and touch it, what happens? Well, you're left with a dirt stain, a grease stain on that wall. Because dirt is very contagious, whereas cleanness is 
not. And so Haggai then reveals where he's going with this verse 14. This is an analogy for the people themselves. Haggai says, so is it with this people in this nation before me. That is their status, their condition before God. They are unclean. Now, some commentators have thought it's because they hadn't yet rebuilt the temple. So the temple there in ruins was uh, like a corpse in their presence. But I don't believe that is where Haggai is going with this. Rather, they're unclean, as we see at the end of verse 17. Because though they had returned to the land, they had not turned back to the Lord. They were living their own way. Even in their religion, everything they were doing, they were just doing it their own way because in sin, your allegiance is to yourself. And so everything that they did, every work of their hands, Haggai says, was defiled because they were doing it. The essence of Sin is that we are committed, first and foremost, to ourselves, aren't we? Rather than loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, it comes so naturally to put self first. That's what's at the heart of sin. We love ourselves rather than loving others. And sin then isn't something that is outside of you Coming in and defiling you. Rather, sin proceeds from our hearts and defiles everything that we think, everything that we say, everything that we do. That's what Jesus tells us. Matthew 15. Jesus is telling them it's not what you eat that defiles you. Yes, it could make you sick. But it doesn't defile you before God even if you ate something wrong. Rather, as Jesus says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. So the first problem then is that sin defiles you and everything that you do. Then notice there's a second problem. Religion cannot cleanse you. Religion cannot save you. The end of verse 14, Haggai says what they offer there, that is on the altar, is unclean. When they returned to the land, they rebuilt the altar before they rebuilt the temple so that they could sacrifice But God's saying the problem is that their sacrifices are defiled. Their sacrifices are unclean and unacceptable to God. Why? Because the people who were offering them were defiled and unclean and unacceptable to God. Now many people think, and maybe that's, maybe you're in that boat this morning, that if you're just really committed to God, If you're sincere in your religion, then God accepts you in it. And so you think, well, if I just add on a little more religion, if I I just do some moral improvement, God will be happy with me. And yet God's making clear here, religion cannot make you acceptable to God. Because your sin defiles even your religion. I've often, as I'm talking with folks, sharing the gospel with them, I'll ask them a question like, okay, if you were to die today, why would God let you into heaven? Or how can you have a personal relationship with God? How can you be saved? To which people will respond with an answer like, well, I'm a good person. I'm religious. I go to church and I give regularly and and I pray regularly and and I read my Bible. 
So therefore, God's got to be happy with me. The problem is, all those religious things, though we should be doing those things, cannot cleanse us, cannot save us. Isaiah 64, verse 6, shows us why. Isaiah writes, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. When Isaiah says all our righteous deeds, all our religious good deeds that we do are like a polluted garment, that word polluted there comes from the Hebrew word that means menstrual. In other words, even our best religious deeds are like unclean menstrual garments. Nobody wants to touch a dirty tampon. (laughs) Think about that for a moment. Your religious deeds, the best things that you do, apart from Christ, God looks at them and it is like touching a dirty tampon to him. So no matter how sincerely you do them, they're unclean, unacceptable to God. No matter how much moral improvement you make, religion cannot cleanse you. So God then calls the people to consider, verse 15. He is calling them, consider from this day Onward, literally it says upward, but in English would be this, you know, time forward. But before he tells them about the new thing that he's going to do, before he tells them the good news, he gives them the bad news, points them back to how life was before they started work on the temple. Reveals a third problem. Sin results In suffering under God's curse. God reminds them of how it was before they started rebuilding the temple those three months ago. They would come to their grain storage. They'd be expecting 20 measures, but instead they'd find there's only 10 there. As if somebody had stolen some. They go to their wine vat to find 50 measures, but instead there's only 20. It leaves them scratching their head wondering, where did it all go? Well, God tells them, verse 17, I struck you in all the products of your toil. Literally, what it says is what it said back in verse 14. I struck all the works of your hands. Why? Because everything that they were doing was defiled. And so it was still under the covenant curse of God. And so the wind from the desert, that scorching wind would come and blight their crops. There was fungus and mildew and hail. Everything was being destroyed under the curse of God. This is exactly what they should have expected. As Moses had warned them in Deuteronomy 28 verse 22. If they rebelled against God, the Lord will strike you with wasting disease and with fever. Inflammation and fiery heat and with drought and with blight and with mildew. And they shall pursue you until you perish. Isn't that exactly what they were going through? Likewise, going on in Deuteronomy 28 to verses 38 and 39, Moses writes, You shall carry much seed into the field, and you shall gather in little. The locust shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and dress them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. God was the one who was actively against them, and so they were suffering under their sin, under the curse. Now let me be clear. I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. Just because you're facing suffering, it doesn't mean that you are under God's displeasure. There's not always that correlation. You, you could be a faithful Christian walking with Jesus, and still you're going to have suffering in this world just because we live in a fallen world. But, 
If you haven't yet turned to God, just as the people hadn't, being in Adam, you are still stained by Adam's sin in your own. So you are still under the curse. You, you are still separated from God. And what that means is that under the wrath of God, the suffering that you are facing now is merely a foretaste of the eternal suffering that is to come in hell, in separation from God. You see, the wages of sin is death. Every sin, every time. So the question is, what's the solution? How can you possibly be made clean and acceptable to God? Because there's all sorts of things that we can try, but those things never work. And so we need to go to God's solution. I have a coffee mug. It became really stained with coffee, and it was pretty disgusting. I still used it, I'm sorry to say. But it had you know, coffee stains all on the bottom. And no matter how hard I scrubbed it, using soap and water, it just wouldn't come out. So somebody said, hey, put some vinegar in it and let it soak. And so I did so. And then I, I just easily was able to take a, a rag and wipe it all out. And the cup became white and looked brand new. Just with a little vinegar. Because I did it the right way. You know, denying the coffee stains didn't make them go away. And so it's the same. Denying sin and shame doesn't make it go away. Just as I had to use the proper solution with the cup, so it is. God alone gives you the proper solution. You need God's solution. And that's what Haggai gives us in verses 18 and 19. The solution is simple. It's that God alone can cleanse you. By his grace alone. Verse 18, God begins, consider, set your heart on these things. There was nothing that they could do to make themselves acceptable to God. But they became clean when they turned back to God. When they came to God his way on his terms instead of their own. They took God at his word. So God promised them in his free grace that he would bless them from that day forward. Even though the seed wasn't yet back in the barn, wasn't yet back in the grain pit. Because it was still out in the field. It was winter. God was saying, I'm going to give you a bumper crop this year to show you that I am for you, not against you. Not because of anything they did, but because of God's mercy, God's free grace toward them. And it's the same for you and for me today. So often people will say that God helps those who help themselves. Couldn't be further from the truth. God helps those who can't help themselves. God helps those who come to realize they can't do anything about it. And all that they can do is rely on God and what he does for them alone. You see, the only way to be acceptable to God, if you're living in your shame, if you're living in sin this morning, if you are bearing the, the weight of your sin, if you're living in it, recognizing your defilement that you are unacceptable to God. What can wash away your sin? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus alone can make you clean. Jesus' holiness, Jesus' cleanness is actually contagious. If you read the Gospels, when... Lepers would come to Jesus. And Jesus would reach out his hand and touch them. Rather than the lepers making Jesus unclean, Jesus made them clean. He healed them. When a woman who was defiled with a flow of blood for 12 years came up and touched Jesus, Jesus didn't become defiled. Instead, Jesus made 
her whole, made her clean. When Jesus went up and touched dead bodies, they didn't make him unclean. Jesus brought them to life again. Jesus alone can make you clean. Jesus came in the flesh, identified with us in our sin and shame, bearing it in the cross. And in the cross, Jesus has reached out to you to cleanse you. Today, if you haven't yet, lay hold of Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You will not be put to shame. You will be welcomed by the Holy God, forgiven and counted as righteous. Jesus came to help us when we were weak and helpless. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul tells us, While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for who? For the ungodly, the unrighteous, the unclean. One will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, Paul says, one might dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were his enemies, unclean, Jesus died for us. That is God's great love for us. Zechariah. Chapter 3, the prophet Zechariah, preaching just two months after Haggai here is preaching, has a vision of Joshua the high priest standing before God. And Satan comes out to accuse him because he is defiled. But Satan is rebuked and The Lord then strips Joshua of his defiled, filthy garments and robes him in new, fresh, clean garments so that he can dwell in the presence of God. When you come to God in Jesus, when you lay hold of Jesus through faith in him, God strips you of your sin-defiled garments and he robes you in the righteousness of Christ. Those fresh, clean garments and nothing can defile them. And nothing can ultimately defile you either. Because God begins a work in your heart. Makes you a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Not because of anything you could do. But all is a free gift. Paid for in the shed blood of Jesus. So God's promise comes to us. Romans 5, 17 through 19. For because of one man's trespass, that is the trespass, the sin of Adam, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Paul just keeps on stacking it up and saying, though in Adam you are defiled and unclean, if you come to God in Christ, you are counted righteous. So the solution is that God alone must cleanse you by His grace alone. What that means is the only proper response is to receive the blessing of God through faith in God's promise. You see, you can't have the blessings of God apart from God himself. That was what the people were trying for, but God's saying, no, I'm not going to give it to you. The way to have the blessings of God is to have God himself. So what you must do is take hold the promises of God. Make them your own by putting your trust in Him, His Word. You see, the gospel isn't about what you can do for God. 
It's about what God has done for you in Christ. So God's promise is that if you will turn from your sin, by the way, that means even the sin of trying to make yourself acceptable to God, if you will turn from your sin to Jesus, God will forgive you and he will welcome you as his own. And he will count you as righteous and clean. If you haven't come to Jesus yet today in faith, that's where you begin. Lay hold of Jesus through faith. If you know Jesus, the Christian life is one of continually holding to the promises of God in faith. It's not Jesus and then you move on to something else. No, it's learning to live out who you are in Christ. As Christians, as Haggai says, we need to continually consider, continually set our hearts and our minds on what God has done for us in Jesus. There are going to be times when as a Christian, you're going to mess up. And you're going to feel shame. You're going to feel defiled. What do you do in those times? You remind yourself of the truth. You remind yourself of God's grace toward you and the promises of God in Christ. Then, when you see other brothers and sisters in Christ struggling, what do you do? You remind them of the grace of God and his promises toward them in Christ, whoever they are. No matter what they've done, no matter their ethnicity, no matter the color of their skin, no matter where they come from or what their life looked like before Christ. No, as God told Peter, when he was to go proclaim the gospel to the Gentile Cornelius, God said, Peter, what God has made clean. Do not call common. Anyone who's in Christ is new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. So, so often we get stuck looking at our sin, looking back at what we've done. But as Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, Don't, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And then listen to what Paul says. And that's you, right? No! Such were some of you past tense. That's who you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. The Spirit applies that work to your life. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ, His blood has washed you. You are clean. You are set apart to God. You have been declared righteous in Christ. That's Who you are. So therefore, all the blessings of God in Christ are yours. Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with not a few, but every blessing of the Spirit in the heavenly realms. That means it's in Christ you're forgiven. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It means you belong to God. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. You are holy, you are clean. And so therefore, you can draw near to God whenever you need Him, whatever you're going through. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How? By Christ. You have hope. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You've been born again to an inheritance that is imperishable. An inheritance that is undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And you, by God's power, being guarded to lay hold of that inheritance. You are guarded by God through faith. God doesn't promise you a life that's going to be free of hardship. Doesn't promise you a life that's going to be easy. Hard times are going to come and they aren't a sign of God's displeasure with you. But God promises to be with you through it. Romans 5, we're promised, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Well, Paul is just getting started there. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in the hard times, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope, listen to this, does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. We have hope. And we will not be put to shame because we have the Spirit of God. I used to visit an elderly lady named Barb. She was, in a, she was homebound in a nursing center. and Until she died, I, I would go in and visit her. And she was from Mississippi, so she had a strong Mississippi accent. And regularly, she told me the same thing again and again. And I was glad to hear it every time. She remembered the very day that she had come to know Christ. She was sitting in a little Mississippi church, and there was a window right next to where she was sitting in the pew. And she said the moment the preacher called them to put their faith in Jesus, she did. And she said, it was like I flew out the window and I was a brand new me. Or maybe when you came to know Jesus, maybe it wasn't as dramatic as that. Maybe you don't even remember that day. God does. And since that day, and every day forward, if you are in Christ, God is determined to bless you. Hope. Because shame and defilement don't have the final word. The risen Lord Jesus does. So because we're defiled by our sin, only God, by his grace alone, can make us clean and acceptable to himself so that he can bless us. And he does so through Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word through Haggai this morning. Great reminder of the hope that we have in Jesus. That in Christ we will never be put to shame. Father, I pray for those who are here, any who don't know you. That God, you would do the work of drawing them to the Savior this morning. Lord, I pray for those who do. Or those who are going through difficult times. Those who are dealing with shame and heartache. Those who are going through life and it seems easy at the moment. Father, wherever everyone is this morning, God, you know where each one is. That you would meet them where they are. Apply your word to their heart and life. Bless them to live in light of the finished work of Jesus and the grace that is ours and the blessings that are ours in him. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.